Hi everyone, and welcome to The Never-Ending Story, The Cultural Evolution of Narratives, Part 5. In this lecture we'll be talking about the genre of fantasy, and thinking about why supernatural concepts might have such an appeal. This lecture is by me, Joe Stubbersfield, and Jamie Tarani. Fantasy Tales of the supernatural are highly successful culturally. We see examples of the supernatural across a wide variety of cultures, whether they be in fairy tales or ghost stories or myths and legends. But a crucial question is, why might stories about things which don't exist or things which are not possible to exist have such an appeal across cultures? Why do we enjoy tales of the supernatural? So to answer this question, we're going to return to content biases. So you'll remember that content biases are cognitive dispositions that we have towards preferentially learning, recalling and transmitting certain types of information over equivalent others. This disposition could have evolved as a useful function in our ev evolutionary past, and content biases are likely to have shaped the way culture has been transmitted and has evolved. For this lecture, we'll be focusing on minimally counterintuitive bias, or MCI. Minimally counterintuitive bias was proposed by Boyer and relies upon the fact that humans have intuitive assumptions of folk biology, folk physics, and folk psychology. Concepts which violate these assumptions are counterintuitive. And Boyer proposed that a balance between satisfying and violating expectations based on these assumptions grants content an advantage in recall and transmission. Let's have a look at these intuitive assumptions in a bit more detail. So intuitive assumptions are basic intuitive theories that humans hold about the world around us. So these can be divided into folk biology, folk physics and folk psychology. So in folk biology, examples might be that we have assumptions like like begets like, as in a cat give birth, gives birth to kittens, that life grows and dies, and also that living beings require sustenance. Folk physics includes assumptions like solidity, so solid objects cannot occupy, this, occupy the same space as other solid objects, and that solid objects will fall to the ground. And continuity, so objects exist continuously in the same space and time. Folk psychology includes examples such as sentient beings having goals, feelings and mental states, and also that we can only know what we've seen or experienced. These intuitive assumptions are core components of human psychology that form as part of natural development and can be found in very young children. And partly we know that they can be found in very young children because young children start to attend to events which breach these assumptions or violate these assumptions from a young age. So if things seem to disappear or move from one container to another, very young children will attend to that and act surprised at it occurring. Once they've developed theory of mind, they understand that mental agents have their own experiences and if they are shown to be able to understand those beyond their own experience, therefore breaching folk psychology, this will surprise children. So partly we know that children have these intuitive assumptions because they show surprise and attend to events which breach these intuitive assumptions. But adults also pay attention to and also enjoy having our intuitions contradicted. So this is the appeal of a magic show. We also like to engage with the impossible, so things we know aren't possible based on these intuitive assumptions. However, it's important to remember that counterintuitive does not mean bizarre. Counterintuitive is something which breaches these intuitive assumptions, whereas bizarre is just something which is novel and strange, but does not challenge these intuitive assumptions. In fiction and myth, our intuitive assumptions are contradicted all the time. 
Our assumptions of folk biology might be contradicted by humans transforming into animals, like in the werewolf myth, or by animals having the capabilities of humans, like the wolf which can talk in Red Riding Hood. Our assumptions of folk physics might be violated by ghosts hovering above the floor and being able to pass through solid walls, or by the wish-granting capabilities of genies. Our assumptions of folk psychology might be violated by the omniscience of gods and their ability to know well beyond what is their own personal experience, or by the future telling of oracles who are able to see into the future again beyond their experience and violating our assumptions of folk psychology. But not all counterintuitive concepts are equal. If you had a story with an invisible ladder versus a story with an invisible weightless ladder that can read minds and talk while being in two places at once, it's likely that the story with the simply invisible ladder would be more successful in culture. But why might this be the case? It seems like there's a sweet spot between intuitive and counterintuitive. A sweet spot between elements that we can comprehend and elements that gain our attention. This is why this bias is minimally counterintuitive bias. It seems that MCI manages to hit this sweet spot between intuitive, intuitive and counterintuitive concepts. It's intuitive enough that we understand it and comprehend it and are able to retain it in our memory, but it's counterintuitive enough that it gains our attention and is likely to stay in our memory. Minimally counterintuitive content bias has been supported by a number of studies using transmission chains and recall experiments, and also by content analyses of folk tales such as Native American folk tales and Grimm's fairy tales. Some researchers have suggested a cognitively optimal number of counterintuitive elements. Barrett and colleagues have suggested one to two counterintuitive elements in a story to make it minimally counterintuitive and cognitively optimal whereas Nora and Zion and colleagues have suggested a cognitive optimum of two to three elements. Nora and Zion and colleagues examined MCI in a memory experiment using different lists. They had four lists, one entirely consisting of intuitive elements, one entirely consisting of maximally counterintuitive elements, so this was entirely full of counterintuitive elements, one which had an equal balance between intuitive and maximally counterintuitive, and then a minimally counterintuitive list, which included a minority of counterintuitive elements with a majority of intuitive elements. They found that recall was best for lists which were minimally counterintuitive, and you can see that in this figure. So. This shows the level of memory degradation and that the lists which were minimally counterintuitive featured the least memory degradation compared to the entirely intuitive lists, the entirely counterintuitive lists, or even the ones which were equal between intuitive and counterintuitive. Table one shows some of the lists, so the intuitive list featuring closing door, thirsty cat and so on, and compares it to a minimally counterintuitive list with a thirsty door, closing cat, and so on. Barrett and Nyhoff conducted a study called the Alien Museum, which featured a narrative describing the Alien Museum, which featured a combination of counterintuitive, bizarre, and common elements. In this experiment, they used a transmission chain design where the material describing the Alien Museum was the original material that which was provided to generation one, and then this was passed along the chain. And, you can, and they could test for the cumulative effect of transmission to see if MCI bias emerged through transmission. They found that counterintuitive items were better recalled than bizarre or intuitive items, 
and this effect was amplified by cultural transmission. So as they went further along the chain, the more counterintuitive elements were recalled compared to bizarre or intuitive items. Barra also conducted a content analysis of international folk tales to see if they contained counterintuitive or minimally counterintuitive elements. This was a nice study with folk tales from a range of different areas. So we had folk tales from Chile, from Russia, from South Africa, from China. And what they did was classify items into ontological categories. So this would be persons, animals, or objects, and then fix them with specific expectation sets, whether they would be folk psychology, folk biology, or folk physics. So with persons, for example, our intuitive assumptions about folk psychology, folk biology, and folk physics would all apply to persons, whereas animals would not feature folk psychology and objects also wouldn't feature folk biology. The counterintuitive score for the folk tales in this analysis was the sum of violations of these expectations. So here's a table from that analysis. And you can see that they coded for a number of different types of counterintuitiveness. So here you see a transfer where an expectation from one category transfers to another. So the expectation from a person category transfers to an animal category. So we have a horse that can talk and this is given a counterintuitive score of one. Or a breach, which contradict expectations of that category. So here we have a dead woman who comes back to life, breaching biological assumptions. And here again, you see that gets a counterintuitive score of one. They also coded breaches within breaches, so contradictions which contradict themselves, essentially, or add further contradictions. So here we have a dead woman who comes back to life, but only at night. So this was given a counterintuitive score of two. So they coded a total of 116 counterintuitive items, and these were identified by a team of independent coders. 99% of the counterintuitive items which were coded had a counterintuitive score of 1 to 2. So again, this supports the hypothesis of minimally counterintuitiveness. So there seems to be an advantage for elements which are only somewhat counterintuitive and not really far out there in terms of the extent to which they breach our intuitive assumptions. It's also interesting to consider how MCI bias might involve evoking other biases. In that study, Barrett coded 114 items which involve transfer of folk psychology assumptions to non-humans, for example, a talking wolf. By transferring assumptions about humans to non-human non animals, it makes that non-human animal a social agent. If they're able to talk, they're able to participate in the story in the same way a human might. This means that not only is it evoking the bias of MCI, it's also evoking social information bias. So in conclusion, supernatural tales are prevalent across a wide range of cultures. MCI bias may explain the appeal of these supernatural elements that are found in these stories. Counterintuitive means breaching intuitive assumptions that humans hold about the world. And there appears to be an advantage of having a minority of counterintuitive elements within a majority of intuitive elements. It seems there's, that there's a sweet spot between gaining our attention through counterintuitiveness but retaining enough intuitiveness to be comprehensible and memorable, hence minimally counterintuitive.